All right. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're able to join us virtually today for our first Art of Empathy lecture or lecture in this lecture series. So there'll be six lectures over this entire academic year. And my name is Alexis Gregg. I teach in the art department in the 3D area. And um, if you haven't taken an art class, I hope that you will and that I get to meet you soon. Um, I'm so excited about this lecture series. It's been uh, a year or so in the making, and it's a really exciting uh, topic that we're, we're dealing with in this series. And I just want to start by saying this whole thing kind of started when I met Carlene Gardner, who is going to be kind of the, the moderator for this, this lecture and also talk a little bit about her work. And Carlene is currently the Kathleen C. Sherrod, Sherrod Deputy Director for Learning and Engagement at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And um, when I met her, she was working as the director, or she was the Director of Learning Innovation at the Minneapolis Museum of Art. And during her time there, she started the Center for Empathy and the Visual Arts in which she envisioned, developed and funded and implemented a multi-year institutional research initiative exploring the impacts of visual arts experiences and fostering empathy in museum visitors. And I was able to talk to her about this whole process in this center and actually go to the uh, Minneapolis Museum of Art and see some of the art that was on display that was kind of dealing with these ideas of empathy. And it really impacted me. You know, it was something that I was really interested in just in general. And, you know, for me personally, um, I, I have experienced some artwork in my life that has been really life altering. And it's because of this use of empathy. Like it's really just sort of uh, helped me feel the humanity and feel humanity in certain ways that nothing else has. And it's a really, really powerful tool. Um, and it's, it's also, you know, a lot of it's studied in science and it's studied in lots of different areas. And so this idea that there was this whole center at the Minneapolis Museum of Art that was looking into this idea was like fascinating to me. And so I thought, oh, this is a perfect opportunity to bring in these experts and people that are working with empathy to help us all understand this concept and how it's used in different ways in psychology and science and in art to, to help us, you know, come together to be better community partners, to be better friends, to be better, you know, partners. And um, so that's sort of the, the birth of this lecture series here. And, you know, I just wanna say, I think through, through the pandemic, we have all felt a lot. Um, I, think, I think we've just all been through a lot. And so it seemed very timely to really think about how empathy can help us move forward and move forward in a better way where we care for each other better, where we um, you know, think about how we use empathy in our relationships, in our work. And so I'm really just happy to, to have this group here. And, and Carleen has really curated the speakers of this series. So I'm so, um, I'm so thankful that she was uh, excited to do this and she's a great collaborator. And, um, and just to plug the rest of these, they will be the third Thursday of every month. So there'll be, you know, um, this is September. We'll have one in October, November, and then they'll pick up again in, um, in the spring semester. So we'll have three speakers this semester and then three in the spring. So I hope you all can, can join again and kind of follow along because I think these, these, these lectures will really build on each other in a, in a nice way. So with, with, um, with excitement, I am going to turn this over to Carlene. Thank you, Alexis, so much. Um, I really appreciate you inviting me to, to join you and to work with you on this. Um, I'm gonna share my screen or try to, let's see. Oops, that is the wrong thing. Sorry about that. Um, one moment, there we go. Here we go. 
So good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm going to really talk about art and empathy and kind of why art and empathy and, and a little bit about what empathy is and what empathy isn't. Um, so um, I love, I wanted to start off with this quote by Olafur Eliasson, who is an amazing artist. And if you haven't had a chance to see some of his works, they are incredible. And he writes that the arts have an incredible potential for expanding interconnectedness, for reaching people, touching them, and increasing empathy and compassion in the world. And I could not agree more with that statement. Um, and then I just wanted to talk about uh, an experience I had as a very young child. I was asked one time, can you remember your first museum experience? And it was in a museum in Mississippi where I'm from, and they had this amazing collection of Pomo baskets. That is a Native American tribe um, that uh, resides in what is currently known as California. And there was a little basket that was just as tiny as the tip of my finger. And I remember as a child, just this awe and wonder, and then thinking about who made it and thinking about their hands and how what tiny little um, movements they would have had to make. And then thinking about who was the person behind this basket. So, you know, in kind of hindsight, I realized that was one of my first empathetic experiences with a work of art. And interestingly enough, it's, it's non-figurative. There's not even, you know, a person in it to connect with, but I still had this human connection through, these, um, through this incredible basket. Um, and then interestingly enough, the, the origin of empathy or Einfühlung, which means in German, feeling into started off with the visual art. Um, uh, Robert Vischer in the late um, 20th century um, or the late 19th century, excuse me, early 20th century, um, who is an aesthetic philosopher from Germany coined this term and it means feeling into. So take like thinking about a, an inanimate object like a painting or a sculpture and imagining yourself in that landscape or as that person and feeling into, into how it would feel to be there or to be that person. So that is where the term Eifulong came from. So it really you know, originated with the visual arts and then later on, it was de um, developed, it went to um, uh, people in the United States, uh, scientists uh, changed it to empathy, kind of translated it, and it had that same meaning, but eventually it's become to be about, you know, having um, emotional connections, perspective taking with human beings. But to the point, uh, the point is that, that art is this amazing catalyst for um, empathetic connections and fostering empathy. And then I briefly just wanted to do a little rundown. Um, empathy is a really complex concept and there's so many different types. And Elise can attest to this. We, had, um, we, we did a think tank um, when we first launched the Center for Empathy and the Visual Arts and nobody in the room, or actually this was not, it, it was a different gathering of empathy people. It was actually in India, I think, but nobody could agree on one definition. Like researchers who re, you know, have spent their lives researching it. So they're all different kinds. So there's effective or uh, your mirror neurons. When somebody laughs, you laugh, or if you see somebody burn their hand and wince, you went. So it's that just kind of um, automatic reaction. Then there's emotional empathy. And that's when we um, understand another person's emotions through their body language or their facial expressions. And then cognitive empathy is about perspective taking, literally trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes and think about how they're feeling or think about things from their point of view. And then one that I think is really um, important is that compassion is empathy in action. Um, so empathy in of itself is not enough. You need to actually put it into practice. Um, and so it's you know, driven by all these things it's a change in behavior and how you, you know, uh, interact and, and treat people in the world. So the ultimate goal is compassion. I wanted to sh say what empathy is not, or kind of the difference between empathy and sympathy. You can see these um, little um, illustrations. You can see how to be sympathetic. It's like kind of, oh, I'm sorry, that's just too bad. I feel bad for you. 
where, as you can see the one, how to be empathetic, um, even visually, you see that connection. It's, oh, I know how you feel. I've experienced that emotion or something that, like that before. And, you know, I, I, I understand you. So just, um, I think a lot of people confuse the two and I think it's important to, to distinguish between the two. And then there's a, like I said, there's a lot of definitions for empathy, but this is the one that I really like to use. It's by um, Roman Kaznarek, who is um, an empathy scholar. He's got a great book, Why Empathy Matters and How to Get It. And he's also the founder of the Empathy Museum that you can see here. And um, the Empathy Museum is a, a traveling museum. It's been all, to places all over the world. And you go into this um, shoe store, which you can see looks like a giant shoe box. And you put on, you get your um, feet measured in, and then put on literally someone else's shoes. You get a headset with a narrative that is narrated by this person. And you literally walk around a body of water for a mile in their shoes. And I, and I did this and it was really one of the most impactful experiences I've ever had. And it made me think about why can't art museums be doing things like this to really foster empathy. So Roman uh, defines empathy as the ability to step into the shoes of another person, aiming to understand their feelings and perspectives and to use that understanding to guide our actions. And empathy is a muscle. Um, we can practice empathy and grow our empathy skills. I wish this little picture had a brain on it too, because it's very much about the heart, but it's also that cognitive too. So it's both the heart and the brain. And you can do things that help you build your empathy skills. And Dr. Sarah Conrath, who you'll be hearing from next month in the series, um, writes, just because empathy is decreasing doesn't mean it's not changeable. There are things we can do and learn. It's like a muscle that we can exercise and develop. So I like to think of as art is like an empathy gym where you can, you know, experience things that you might not normally experience and continue to build your muscles and really become a more compassionate and empathic person. And I think art is just an amazing catalyst it's an expression of what it is to be human. And art can help us see things from others' perspectives, think about things from their, uh, think about their emotions um, and really think about, um, and it can also bring people together like a, a, in a discussion um, and really build understanding and connection. And these are all um, objects from the Philadelphia Museum of Art, from our collection. Um, so some of the things that the ways that art can foster empathy is really identifying and naming emotions. And in a lot of my work in Minneapolis, we developed an empathy tour and used artworks for people to, you know, they experienced them, they identified the emotions they were feeling, the emotions they see, um, the people in um, paintings like this, uh, Corbet are feeling. And it really, once you, and you start learning those facial um, expressions, it helps us to better understand um, other people's emotions and to, to um, be more empathic for, towards them. Also, um, art can be an expression by an artist. Like this is by the artist um, Kusama, who probably a lot of you know for, um, for infinity rooms that are amazing. But this was an early painting that she did and it's almost this yin yang. She used art as a way to cope with her emotions and her mental illness. So that hints all the dots, but this was about both positive and negative emotions. Um, and so as a viewer, your emotions might be ignited by these bright colors, the vibrant colors, the different shapes, but then getting into that personal story of the artist also get, helps us better understand the artist and then better understand her work. And hopefully help, you know, help people better understand uh, the world around them and the people that we live with. Perspective taking is in very, another important um, part of empathy. And this is um, actually um, a, a kind of a thinking routine as they're called, uh, developed by Harvard uh, Project Zero. And it's about you know, perspective taking. So it's really stepping into the shoes of another person, 
um, identifying what their thoughts and feelings are. Um, and then also it helps us realize that sometimes we can't um, become empathetic or make judgments at face value or on the surface that we need to really dig deeper. And sometimes we need more information. And uh, I think this exercise also helps you realize that you can't truly ever step into the shoes of another person, but that really practicing and doing that can help us really build those skills. Um, and so I think um, these are really great exercises. I've um, experienced these in many times in the museum and seen incredible results. I did want to just give you um, a better picture um, of this artwork. Um, it is a great one for doing this exercise because there's so many diverse characters uh, in the painting. And um, this has really led to a lot of great conversations. And oftentimes we, um, as museum educators, don't give people information about the artwork first. We let them have their own you know, first impressions and reactions and interpretations. And then um, you can kind of layer in more information about the artist um, and, and build deeper understanding for the artwork itself, as well as understanding for the artist. And this is by uh, Paul Cadmus. And then um, as museum, um, we did a lot of research on kind of empathy interventions. Um, this was an amazing exhibition, Hearts of Our People, Native Women Artists. And we really wanted these female artists in the show to be, to humanize it, not just to have the artwork, but to have their voices. Um, so you can see the two women um, have headphones on. They're um, first person um, stories, narratives from the artists themselves, talking about their artwork, their life, their experiences. And then in the back um, right, you can see a video on the wall. So we had these large screen videos uh, mounted throughout the exhibition. And it was lovely. I mean, the women's voices just really permeated the space. And we did some research after this exhibition and through the audio tour and the videos, people felt much more connected to the artists. They felt they understood their lives and their experiences much more. Um, and it felt much more humanized to them than if it had just been a label on the wall. Um, some of the other things that um, we've done, um, this was an exhibition by a curator, you can see Casey Riley, she's got the red skirt on, and she um, was curating an exhibition, starting off with photographs of Lewis Hine, who's photographed in the middle, and his work really um, helped end child labor um, during the early part of um, the 20th century. And she was going to do a show on his artwork, but she said, you know, it's all about kids. So I need young people's voices in the show. I need their perspective. So the education team collaborated with her. You can see some of um, the students who participated in this. They wrote labels. They helped um, select the paint colors for the exhibition. They selected some of the photographs. And then you can see um, Kane who um, was a middle school student at the time with the, the yellow hoodie on, he's with artist Rania Matar. And he wrote the label for this artwork. And I walked up in the exhibition opening and I saw Rania in front of the painting, I mean, of the photograph crying. And she said that what Kane had wrote was written was so powerful that it moved her so deeply because it was such from the perspective of a young person. And you can see, that the, the um, there's a, I don't know if you can, it's probably too far away, but the, the photograph, there's a young woman that Rania had been um, documenting her life from a refugee camp until her family got out. But she thought really that Kane really captured uh, what the young woman in the photograph was thinking and feeling, especially from the perspective of a teenager. So just thinking about kind of changing our practices at museums and not having just a curator, um, but bringing in multiple voices and viewpoints is a real key to um, empathy building. And um, I wanted to end with this. And I, um, Dr. Uh, Jamil Zaki, who is at Stanford, he um, does a lot of research on empathy. And um, I'm just going to read this to you because I think it kind of sums up what I was saying. 
He says, I think of lots of different forms of art as empathy boot camp. It's a lot easier to insult someone in a YouTube comment section when you're anonymous and they're anonymous and you don't have to see their reaction than when you're right in front of them. The arts act as an antidote to that estrangement and provide you with a very low risk way of entering the worlds and lives and minds that are far from what you would normally experience. Empathy is often work. It's an effort that you make to find the commonalities between yourself and someone else. Um, so um, I, I realized my slide was out of order. That was supposed to be my last slide, but I'm gonna share a couple more things with you. Sorry about that. Um, some of the ways too that we uh, thought about empathy through programming at the Minneapolis Institute of Art was bringing artists in to share their viewpoints and perspectives. And this program right here was with the Advocates for Human Rights. We um, were doing a series on migration, um, immigration and the refugee crisis. And so we reached out to spoken word artists who were refugees to Minneapolis and asked them to create artwork based, inspired by a piece of artwork in our collection. And they performed that in the galleries and then had a conversation with the participants about their experiences and what it was like being refugees uh, in Minneapolis. So really first person narratives, hearing people's stories and then having art as a vehicle are such um, powerful things that I would also say having that conversation at the end also really helped people connect across difference and kind of find some commonality. Okay, so that was my last slide. I will um, stop sharing and I'm gonna introduce our next speaker tonight. It um, is Zorana Pringle, who is the senior research scientist and she's director um, of the Creativity and Emotion Lab at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence at Yale University. And her talk is Emotion Skills Are the Basis for Creativity. So I will turn it over to you, Zorana. I was muted. Um, thank you, Carleen. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm going to start sharing my screen just one second here. Um, okay, so let me put that in a sharing mode. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation to be here with you. And uh, I want to talk to you about emotion skills. So I work at a place called Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. And uh, we all work on um, what are emotion skills, emotion abilities. People differ in how um, able they are in perceiving their own emotions uh, and emotions of others in using those emotions um, to help them with problem solving and decision making, um, understanding the nature of emotions, where they are coming from, where they are leading, and also um, managing them for um, uh, in order to reach their goals of uh, well-being and connection with others. Um, and I personally am very much interested in creativity and art. And a number of years ago was invited to um, by a foundation in Spain, the Botin Foundation, um, to create programming for the art center they were about to found. Um, and uh, we have used all our scientific research on what is the nature of emotion skills? What is the nature, nature of emotional intelligence? How it can be learned, because it can be learned, um, and uh, how to do that through art. Um, so uh, what I want to talk to you about today is starting with that question of what is empathy. And Carlene has introduced us really beautifully to it from the historical standpoint. Um, and I find it uh, really beautiful uh, that the word originates from the world of art. Um, 
and we are feeling into a piece of art and that has then been uh, historically extended to feeling into other people. Um, and uh, we use oftentimes this metaphor of walking into somebody else's shoes. So, so staying with that metaphor for a second, what does that involve? Well, uh, it involves the willingness to do that. Uh, we are comfortable in our own shoes. Uh, and the shoes of other people might be somewhat uncomfortable. Um, it can it can even um, evoke some emotions of hmm, do we even want to touch them? <laughs> uh, and uh, it also is these are shoes that we are not familiar necessarily with that we didn't break into. Um, there is that element of. Uh, courage to decide to get into uh, that situation. And there can be some discomfort in the process. Um, and uh, in this picture, the shoes are very different. Sometimes they are not so different, uh, but there is still that uh, element of there is something that we are not fam fully familiar with uh, in the process. Uh, where my research and my educational work uh, comes in is trying to understand what are the necessary building blocks uh, of empathy. And um, Kerline has spoken uh, to this uh, somewhat, and we are kind of building onto each other here. Um, uh, in psychology, when we are thinking of where behaviors, uh, different behaviors are coming from, there is uh, usually um, a two part to it. One part is knowing how to do something. And another part is in some way wanting to do it, thinking that it is uh, valuable and um, being interested in seeing the value of this behavior, whatever it is. And applied to empathy, this knowing component means being able to understand others, take those perspectives, being able to, to see what they are feeling or imply what they are feeling. And that emotional component of empathy is then feeling what others are feeling, experience it and caring to experience it ourselves. Um, in my work, we are um, primarily focusing on the knowing part and on um, what it takes to um, have that ability to imply what others might be going through. And oftentimes where we start is by seeing others. We as humans are very much uh, relying on, on the sense of uh, seeing and on perceiving others. Um, and we are trying to collect clues about what they might be experiencing. We are collecting clues, but these clues are oftentimes inconclusive. We have pieces of a puzzle, we have to try to read them, uh, but there is an element of imagination in that process too, drawing on personal experiences, drawing of knowledge of, of people in general. And we are doing a lot of reading on nonverbal cues here. Um, Certainly, we can go by what people are saying and what they are communicating consciously, but there is much more than that. Um, and oftentimes, people are consciously, uh, willingly, and verbally communicating one thing, but we are getting other clues that something else also might be going on. So uh, we could be inferring about emotions and from... Um, people's silences, uh, from uh, people's expressions. Uh, in our digital world, we are inferring uh, feelings from, well, how long it takes from somebody to respond or not respond, or those three little dots uh, and observing those three little dots, are they going to get into something? 
uh, we are also inferring information about emotions from people's uh, paraverbal uh, information, which which means all those clues that are not the words themselves, but how the words are produced. Tone of voice, um, uh, volume of voice, uh, uh, accents. These are all different clues. Body language is another one. Touch can be uh, something when we are in person and communicating in person that, that we can infer from. So all of these are pieces of a puzzle, um, but putting a puzzle together is, uh, can be interesting, can be motivating, but can be also rather difficult, especially when you don't have that guide on the box of the puzzle to know what is going to happen with it. And uh, context matters a great deal. So um, what do you think the girl in this picture is experiencing. Feel free to unmute yourself and 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 share if you if you have an idea. She looks sad. She might look sad. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, she's upset about something. Upset, mm -hmm. yeah, it could be. I think she's sort of unsure or uh, like somewhat like disgusted by something maybe, uh, like a bug or something that she's seeing for the first time or very close. <laughs> yes, certainly. Uh, so, so these are all somewhat related but, um, and perfectly valid uh, guesses. We do not have enough information. The context matters. We have a little bit of a glimpse that somebody else is in the picture, but we don't know who that person is. We don't know what their relationship is. We don't know what she is looking at. Um, it, it sort of looks like a Zoom box, right? We have a little bit of information, but we don't have a full picture. We need more information. Sometimes in our daily lives, we jump to a conclusion. We can jump to a conclusion that she's sad. We can jump to a conclusion that she's disgusted. These are all valid guesses, but we really don't know what's going on without more information. So in, in, reading, um, in reading people's, uh, people's emotions, we need an attitude of curiosity and an awareness that we are not going to have a full, um, full picture. Um, at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, we work to teach people um, emotion skills. And this is largely done um, through schools, through social emotional programming in schools, which are becoming more uh, popular in the US and across the world. My work personally is a little bit different in nature. I uh, certainly believe that schools are valuable places of learning, including social emotional learning. Um, but because my, my primary research interest is in understanding creativity, I, I have learned some important lessons uh, about um, contexts of learning. And we oftentimes learn better when we choose to engage with some material, uh, when we are not made to uh, do something, but, um, uh, but are approaching it because of interest and challenge in uh, some activity. Um, and uh, when we can um, really engage with different kinds of materials uh, in learning. So um, museums are ideal places for that kind of learning. They are offering a great variety of, um, of learning materials. 
uh, people can find different kinds of material that is appealing to them more or less, and they can identify with. And so a uh, lot of my um, research has been focused on art as a vehicle of building uh, emotional intelligence skills. And uh, we have created programs for children, adolescents, professional adults, families, whole families with, with parents and children. Um, and then being scientists, we are testing what are people really learning through these programs and what are the new skills that they are developing. Um, why art? Uh, what, is, what is ideal uh, with art as the vehicle? Art conveys emotion in itself. Uh, and um, what, what happens in, um, in attempting to learn about emotions is, well, we are going to learn about emotions by practicing it. We learn everything by practice. And we learn everything by um, uh, getting feedback. So think about learning a new language. Um, you start not knowing much, maybe you have heard some words, maybe you had some exposure through different cultures or through travel, um, but it, it's a certain level of familiarity that then you build on uh, more formally. Uh, but as you build on it, you have to practice and you have to get feedback. Maybe your pronunciation is not quite right in the beginning. Uh, and you need to uh, build how to do it better. The same thing in learning about emotions. Um, traditionally, we kind of learn about emotions haphazardly. We learn it through our families um, and uh, we learn it through um, kind of random process of figuring out whether we have read somebody correctly or not. But that learning can be more intentional. Um, and uh, in order to get that feedback, we really have to be talking about emotions and being open to discussing them. Well, that can be uncomfortable. Um, and the people in different cultures also vary how comfortable they are and how willing they are to engage in talking about personal feelings. Um, and art provides a way to talk about feelings, to talk about emotions in a, in a neutral way. Uh, so you don't have to start with sharing personal joys or personal uh, distress. Um, you can start building this awareness of reading cues uh, in a piece of art and discussing with others and building community and trust that then can translate into a willingness to discuss more personal uh, experiences. Um, so we can start by, uh, by trying to get into that piece of art, like feeling into art, looking at what are the cues in art, whether it is portraying something that is more happy, something that is calming and balanced, examining why we are getting these, these feelings, feeling into the work, um, or whether it is very sad. This is actually personally, uh, in my opinion, the saddest painting ever done in the whole history of art. And, and I have a very hard time even, even dealing with it. Um, and um, uh, it is easier to talk about this piece than, uh, than talk about the saddest experiences in our personal lives. And then people can build from that. And indeed, working with Centro Botin in, uh, in Spain, um, we have done that. And we have uh, tested uh, people's development of these skills um, through time. So before they go through art-based uh, courses and workshops, after they complete them, and then we follow them through time to see 
um, whether they are they are uh, continuing to use these skills and building on them. Um, there, I'm going to end uh, and uh, uh, go back to Carleen to introduce her final speaker. Thank you, Zorana, so much. So now um, I'd like to introduce Elise Gokshidem, who is the founder and president of ONE, which is the Organization of Networks for Empathy. She is also the founder for Empathy Building Through Museums. And her talk is titled Opening Windows from Heart to Heart, Designing for Empathy as a Portal to Love. So I'll turn it over to you, Elise. Thank you so much, Carleen. Uh, hello, everyone. So happy to be here. And this is a very um, enlightening and inspirational um, conversation. So I'm glad that I'm uh, also a part of it. Um, let me see now if I can share my screen. And let's see. Is this working? OK. Um, Probably you can see everything, right? So let me do the. Uh... Okay, hold on, one more thing. Okay, um, can you see the sidebar at this time, or just the main slide? We can see the sidebar. You had it for a minute where we couldn't, I think. Okay, okay, let me see. Um, so I think, um, can you see the screen? Can you see it all right? Yeah, there you go, that's perfect. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so um, thank you for the wonderful introductions on, you know, what empathy is, you know, what does it look like in a museum and, um, and how it can be attained, as, uh, as uh, both Carlene and uh, Zorana mentioned, uh, using museums as uh, empathy building gyms, which is a term I like. Um, and in this and why empathy? Why is it so essential? What, to what end are we trying to build empathy in the world? And as you might have noticed, you know, all our global organizations are, have been you know, recently urging us uh, all the time to uh, like the statement from the United Nations, you know, to achieve a sustainable future for all, we need to act urgently to protect biodiversity, the web of life that connects and supports us all. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis of, uh, on the all and, and to take an action to protect some sort of diversity. And in this statement, I would also add our cultural diversity uh, and all kinds of diversity, uh, that, which that is what supports us all at the end. But, uh, and it seems like our human civilization at this stage um, has the knowledge and the technologies and the resources that can tackle some of these you know, problems uh, easily. Uh, but there seems to be a, a, a disconnection where we try to translate our knowledge into compassionate actions for the whole, uh, which is how traditional uh, you know, uh, wisdoms of tradition describe a wisdom. Uh, as, in, as an awareness of each is a part of something much greater than uh, herself, himself. And, and that, that's why there's a need to uh, protect and preserve the integrity of the whole. Um, so what would, what would make us care for the other? What would make us uh, uh, take an action towards the well-being of the other? Uh, I believe this has much to do with how we see ourselves and our place in this world. And empathy is integral to this process. And uh, more and more, I mean, I have been using this little red prop, you know, to illustrate this point, because 
in a world that is so beings, but all beings, including our environment, our you know all living beings, including plants and animals, as well as our planet with its rivers and mountains and one magnificent ocean, and uh, as well as our planet's innermost and outermost layers, which are also a part of this whole. And science tells us that our planet works, works like one body, right? If something goes wrong in one part of the world planet, it is eventually felt uh, everywhere. And uh, traditional wisdom also tells us that humanity works just like one body. If our fingertip hurts, we feel the pain in our entire body. So the main question is, what kind of education, and I believe that this has to be an experiential education, just like both Carleen and Zorana mentioned, what kind of education or experiences we need to integrate into our education so that the human, the part here, with the whole. This recognition requires more than actual ability. It requires a heart connection. Where as we go into ourselves and look within, as Zorana mentioned, recognizing the thought, we see the world than ourselves. And when we go into the world and look at the other, so this is more like a heart connection, which I, I'll try to uh, explain. Um, uh, thanks to uh, Zorana Isevich, Dr. Isevich here, uh, uh, I think you introduced her, Isevich Pringle, uh, who helped me uh, put together this uh, chart, uh, empathy definition chart, because as a non-scientist, started working my first post through music. Where do you, so I Googled what empathy is, and I said, hmm, the visionary. So I use the Webster definition as the basis of my work, but then with the help of Zorana, I was able to uh, better articulate for myself. And, I are. and these letters are not linear. They are like, you know, uh, they're, they're non-linear. Uh, there's, like, you know, so forth. All of this can happen at once. One part can be heavier than other and um, so on and so forth. Um, so this, eventually this uh, transformation from a dualistic way of seeing the world to seeing the oneness in everything uh, and everything and empathy teaches us. In the context of designing for empathy framework and empathy building through museums initiative, my working definition of empathy is a form of person selves and with others while awakening us into our oneness. Empathy leads us to develop a recognition of the intrinsic value of each unique element that makes up the whole and encourages us to calibrate and harmonize our attitudes and behavior within this whole accordingly. Here, empathy is not the end goal, but it is a foundational element of human development, and it is a portal for us to recognize and tap into our humanness, our capacity for compassion, altruism, and most importantly, love. Science tells us and shows us what empathy is and how it occurs in our brains, but how we imagine it and what kinds of meanings we give to empathy is also equally important. As Susan Lanzoni, a science historian and author of Empathy, a History, concludes in her book, the ways in which we imagine empathy are important for these imaginings themselves can open out new possibilities for connection. Empathy dares us to move beyond the habitual borders of the self to reach toward another human being, animal, art, art object, or the natural world. We need the self to empathize but we also have to leave it behind. This is one of empathy's mysteries, but it is also its promise. 
I do believe personally, that's where my work you know, took me, uh, is that you know, empathy is a portal to love, can be a portal to love. It is a very precious tool for human beings, for us to get to know love as the essence of all things. So this necessity of pragmatic perspective shift uh, is a, a major dilemma. But in this dilemma, I think museums have an opportunity to explore. Uh, and this is the this is the this is a challenge that I uh, posed to myself in the beginning. Uh, and and you know I uh, have this quote which I really like. Uh, uh, how a 13th century, 12th, 13th century uh, poet philosopher Rumi says. Uh, you are not just a drop in the ocean, but you are the entire ocean within a drop. So how do we get the drop to understand that it is in fact the ocean itself? So the challenge is how might we utilize our museums for intentional empathy building to raise awareness of our essential interconnectedness so that we live with the whole of humanity, environment, and our planet. Uh, designing for empathy framework and all my work in empathy building through museums is a response to this challenge. Uh, this journey started with the empathy building through museums initiative and now operates under one uh, organization of networks for empathy. Uh, this is a new organization that I just found, found. And, um, and you can find more information on our activities and some of the resources that are available uh, on our website, oneempathynetwork.com. Uh, uh, the first book, Fostering Empathy Through Museums, uh, which uh, included 15 uh, contributed chapters from multidisciplinary experts from museums and outside museums to see how they define empathy uh, and if they are intentionally working to foster empathy in the world through their institutions. And what I learned the, the out is the outcome of this research collaboration uh, that it, it turns that, you know, it turns out that our intuition about museums being the best platform, a uniquely available platform, is in fact true and scientifically proven. Museums hold a mirror to society, a safe place for encountering the other. So they're a space, a container for an encounter. Uh, they are also uh, natural storytellers, uh, but they also have an important role to create new narratives. If our current narratives are not helping us, and which is what some of the you know uh, most museums are going through right now through their uh, 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 initiatives on uh, equity, diversity, and access. We need to change those narratives, and uh, and museums can be the place to begin that uh, transformation. They are places of experiential learning, which we seem to all agree, uh, and they are places that where we can experience what an awe and wonder what those experiences can be can be like. And also museums enable us to slow down and, uh, and, and take some time to contemplate. So these are uh, what make uh, museums as unique platforms for uh, empathy building. And in Designing for Empathy, uh, uh, my second book, which uh, includes 23 contributed chapters, again, from multidisciplinary uh, experts and scholars from museums and outside museums to deepen our understanding of what empathy is and what it can mean for our world. Uh, and it asks three major questions. What is the object of our empathy? So empathy by definition requires duality, right? There has to be the self and the other, but I'm talking about oneness as a solution to our problems. So can, is empathy possible uh, without an object as if we are empathy? empathizing the whole, which is also us at the same time. And some traditions, some world, you know, cultures actually through uh, their art and uh, rituals. Uh, the alchemy of empathy is uh, what makes empathy? Um, uh, what are some of the qualities that uh, are uh, that we experience in a trans transformational empathetic experience, and um, and and I believe that if we can uh, articulate, notice, and articulate these ingredients, 
Uh, and in the book, there are 13 ingredients as discussion starters, conversation starters. I think we can better understand and then use them uh, as, our, uh, as part of our design. Uh, this could be design of a curriculum, this could be design of a museum exhibition, or, or our lives around it, to be essentially, you know, to, uh, to be honest. And finally, what is the scope and the spectrum of empathy? To what end? Empathy permeates all aspects of our lives. So whatever do we do about empathy will have an impact on our education, uh, our, you know, entrepreneurship, business, innovation, design, uh, our, you know, leadership, uh, and, and um, how important decisions are made, essentially. So, uh, so it is a journey. The more we understand, I think the better we are, we will be equipped to design those tools for empathy building. And when we build empathy, we, we will learn through museums and we can uh, refine and make our tools more sophisticated as we go. Uh, just to, 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 to clarify, you know, some of the uh, terms that I have used, you know, designing for empathy, uh, this is work in progress. Uh, and, and my definition of designing for empathy is a framework and an international platform for multidisciplinary cross-sectors collaboration to deepen our understanding of empathy and to develop context relevant tools for empathy building, utilizing oneness as a master perspective. So what is oneness mindset? It is a master perspective inspiring how we might see our world and our place in it, informing how we might utilize our tools, including our knowledge of empathy and all other kinds of knowledge, resources, institutions, information, technologies, and systems towards harmonious engagements with the whole. What is empathy building? For within this framework, empathy building is an intentionally designed transformative, perspective shifting, and perception expanding lived experience, which utilizes the ingredients of alchemy of empathy to develop self-knowledge. Through self-knowledge, we can notice, observe, and articulate the filters and biases that affect our ourselves, the ability to develop capacity for accountability and self-correction in our engagements with the other. In a nutshell, this is a very you know, new illustration that I'm still working on, but this is how I envision the journey of the self uh, on, the, on, the, on the journey of empathy. So self on journey of the self on the journey of empathy. Uh, each self begins the world with, a, with its, its own worldview, right? And that's where self and the ego. Uh, empathy requires courage and vulnerability to break that shell and to reach out. It doesn't really require breaking that shell. You can still have it, but you spend experiences and using art. You can explore a library of narratives and a perception uh, and, and be better equipped to be there. Uh, you can still hear because I feel like uh, hear me? So, uh, I hope you hear me. Uh, yeah, you're kind of freezing up, Elise. We might have just lost a leave, so hopefully she'll rejoin. Well, this could be a good time. If anybody has any questions, you could unmute or you could type things in the chat. Um, Elif may may have been close to the end of, of her discussion, but if anybody had any questions for Anyone, maybe maybe you could put them in the chat while Alif finishes up and we could address those um, at the end. Now we see you again, Alif. Alif, did you finish your, were you able to finish your presentation? If you got kind of cut off, so. 
Okay. Were, were you able to see the last slide with the illustration? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so beautiful. that was beautiful. Basically, uh, so uh, that that's how I envisioned empathy's role in uh, self transformation from a self centric worldview to a worldview where we appreciate each unique part that makes the whole. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, I don't see anything in the chat, but if anybody has any questions, you could unmute or you could type things in the chat. I have a few things, but I don't need to necessarily interject right away. I just had a quick question. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, awesome. Um, so the illustration that we just saw about the self-centric worldview, does that mean that innately we all see the world that way? I just think of the role of motherhood in that and how that plays a role in like humans nature well women's nature for that matter but i think that role in our innately in us makes us more sympathetic or empathetic I guess today. um and so just going back to that illustration do you feel like that self-centric world view is that innately in us and that's why we have to go on the self journey or do we have empathy within ourselves already um, I, I, I do believe that we have empathy in ourselves already, uh, although uh, science also tells us that it uh, might also depend how we are made, you know, how our physiology is, uh, how our you know, brain is wired. So uh, there may be, you know, those of us who are more prone to you know, empathy or compassion with empathy. And that's why, you know, we end up perhaps needing empathy in one of those layers or in between those layers. Uh, but uh, motherhood and love is, I think, essentially where, you know, we would like to go, you know, and I do believe that empathy can be a portal for that. Love is if there's no object, loving another uh, for, as, as he, recognizing the individualness, the uniqueness of that other. Um, and I think that's the, the ultimate goal of uh, being a human being. Uh, a scholar from uh, American University, uh, once, you know, he was asked, he asked some, another scholar, actually, uh, he said, you know, what is the ecological, ecological purpose of human being? You know, like, I mean, trees give us oxygen, water give us life. And, you know, like we know all that. What is the ecological purpose of human being? And, and he answered the question as love. Uh, only human beings can hold love for all and intentionally practice uh, to be better at that. I hope that. Yeah, I just wanted to add to um, Sarah, there's a really interesting project that started in Canada, and I think it spread to some different countries, but it's called Roots of Empathy. And um, they bring babies or young kind of young, young infants or young children into the classroom. And the kids in the classroom interact with the babies. And it really having those young people, they start thinking about the world from that baby's perspective. And so babies can be a tool for empathy building. I would say as a mother, I feel like my empathy skills grew a lot more when I had children. Um, so there's some definite research um, around how, you know, babies and then, I mean, and then I'm going to say motherhood really um, do help us build our empathy, empathy skills. On, on a little bit different angle there, since we are interested in different angles here, um, the, the the last slide that Elif showed um, with starting from a, from a sort of self-centered point can be also looked at developmentally as, as babies, so babies from a different perspective, as babies face the world, one of the big developmental tasks is for them to tell the difference where they end and where physically somebody else begins. So that, that is self-centeredness in a different way in understanding that, that we are 
different entities. Um, but then developmentally, what also happens is uh, learning to understand the self and then learning to, uh, uh, to uh, read others' emotions, understand that they are different emotions and that not only we feel them, but others do too, and that we can imply to a certain extent from personal experience to others and connect that way. So in, in some developmental sense, there is that um, there's that starting from the point of learning the distinction and then building the connection. Any other questions of anybody that wants to unmute? Uh, my question is just sort of how, as an educator, because I know I know Carlene, you've you've worked with um, schools and and universities and colleges, and as an educator, like how can we, in a nutshell, or maybe if you just want to give some examples, like how can we teach with an empathy forward perspective, or like you know approach our courses in a more empathetic way. I think that's a great question. I'm sure Zorana has um, something to add as well. I, and I think um, just modeling and practicing empathy, thinking about things from your students' perspective, and I think also in class, trying to create opportunities for that empathy skill building, whether it's through art, um, you know, literature is also another a great um, empathy builder. Uh, thinking about history and th there's, you know, the, there's a whole um, uh, genre called uh, historical empathy and thinking about, you know, things from the past and putting yourself in the shoes of people and thinking about the decisions they made. Um, I think, you know, being in, being empathetic to yourself as, as a, an educator and thinking about the emotions and the needs of your students, but then also creating opportunities for people to kind of flex those muscles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much agreed. Um, to, to teach from empathy, uh, you have to see people. And um, it takes effort to see people. It can be sometimes inconvenient to see people because you already have a plan. Uh, we all who have taught had our plans and oftentimes it happens that our plans do not match realities. So now we are facing this decision point. Do we go on with our plan with what we think should be done or whether we abandon it, recreate it, improvise it and be creative in order to meet people where they are and then bring them to those places where we would like them to be. Um, but that is very difficult because oftentimes you, you have to improvise um, and that is uncomfortable on different levels, right? It is, you want to, you want to engage with others, um, but it comes with a cost. Any other thoughts or questions? I have another question. Um, I wonder both from an artist's perspective or from someone who works at a museum, how do you make that decision of which story or narrative to share? And I know you, if you're on this journey to be more empathetic or you're just starting or you are looking to look at the art or different things that way, um, and so I, I, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but I was looking at a um, collection at the Met and it was the Afrofuturism collection. And it was really from a place of empathy and it was truly remarkable, but it was, it felt like at the time, I don't remember the year, but I'm pretty sure it was a, uh, it might've been during the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. But it feels like 
those those stories and voices and nar narratives are being heard at this time or they were specific at, at the time and so many just companies and it, really everyone in the media was taking on these stories and sharing them for whatever purposes um and you know that would be that's an, another question in itself but um at one point do you not look performative in and if you're an activist, at what point do you not look performative in showing empathy? You don't just want to look like part of everyone else that's doing that because it feels like the right thing to do. Um, but also, how do you make the decision, okay, what's the right narrative to share and which of these stories matter? Uh, because there is a collective experience that maybe it's it's part of your project. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sort of going everywhere here, but it, I'm going back to how do you make the right decision? What how do you decide which narrative, which story um, on this journey and how can you still be inspired by movement? Can you still be inspired by a, an event in time? And, and if so, how do you not make it seem so performative? And I'm not saying the Met was that, but I think that was an illustration of something that was happening in that time. Um, that was a remarkable uh, collection, but uh, does that make sense? I know I sort of took questions together, but how do you decide which narrative, which stories, and how, if it's, it was inspired by an event, how do you not make it look performative? Um, yeah. A great question, Adriana. And I, I, I am not going to pretend that I know the answer. I think this is such a big question that, um, that it's a whole topic for a long conversation. Um, but uh, uh, I can speak from one perspective of how we approach this in our educational work. Um, and uh, I, I think if you ask a question, what is the right narrative? I don't think there is an answer. I don't think there is the right narrative. Uh, the, at the core of empathy is openness to different narratives. Um, and uh, and seeing people from where they are and what they are experiencing. So from that perspective, there is no right narrative. How we use that belief in, in our work is that we do not, um, when we work in a museum, we do not choose a piece of art uh, that we then work with. Rather, we create activities that are such that people go into the museum space, into galleries, and then um, have different, different prompts, but they are the ones who pick the pieces of art that are speaking to them and from which they can share and they can engage with. That way we are working from the perspective that is meaningful to people to people themselves. So this is one way we are coping with it. I, I don't think there is, a, there is one answer, but this is how we are addressing it in our work. Yeah, I would say, um, Adriana, the question you asked, I think all museums are grappling with it right now. Uh, I mean, I think historically museums have, and still do, predominantly exhibit work by white male artists. Um, and so I would say, I mean, not the right, I think Zorana is exactly right, it's multiple narratives, but I think it's got to be um, an institutional commitment and a, a long term strategy and value to um, uplift historically marginalized voices, artists, and I think that you're absolutely right that many museums, especially um, after the murder of George Floyd, uh, did, you know, exhibitions that were very performative and then kind of probably went back to their old ways. Um, so I think it's a big challenge and I think it's a commitment that, that museums need to make if we want to be relevant and reflective of our, our community. So I think, like Zorana said, there's no right answer, but um, I think it's really an uh, institutional commitment that it's just not a, a one-off thing that um, it needs to be seen as um, a very long term goal and, um, and value. And, and I, I also would like to add to that, um, Adriana, that um, just like, you know, how empathy begins with self knowledge, it is also on the institutions part. 
and and uh, who who is making those decisions? You know, what does the museum board look like? What does the curatorial you know staff look like? Uh, you know, what are their backgrounds? What do they represent? What do they believe in? You know, those things all matter. And uh, there are some great movements in the museums community uh, uh, now that that are tackling these sort of what I call the institutional empathy uh, building. Uh, and I think once that is, and it's a, again, it's not a, like a linear thing. Uh, we cannot wait for our institutions to be perfect so that they can have like perfect exhibitions. Uh, but uh, this is a challenge that we need to tackle from all fronts and see, you know, and, and learn as we go. And I would just add to that too, and not just relying on the people that work at the museum for those narratives, looking outside and getting people with different experiences, expertise and knowledge to help contribute to um, what's being displayed and um, how we're interpreting it and what voices we're uplifting. The, um, this, is, this is Susan, I'll just chime in with a, a comment, I guess, um, on this. Can you all hear me? Um, as the director of the uh, museum here in Macon, um, you know, in addition to being, um, you know, very conscious and intentional about um, the artists that we invite into the museum to exhibit work and the way we narrate stories um, and curate certain things. There's also, uh, we have really, really become acutely aware of just the changing value and changing meaning and changing response to particular items um, over the last, I would say two to three years. So, you know, certain items that we didn't realize um, you know, might be offensive or carry, you know, um, certain histories within them. Um, you know, we're, we're now starting to realize some of th that we haven't been capturing the changing interpretation um, of a particular object. And, and, and that also is extremely challenging, you know, almost takes a bit of co-creation with the interpretation of particular items um, it's exciting to think that, you know, a doll, for example, might have so many layers, um, you know, that we haven't even mined out yet, you know, but, um, or certain objects or pieces of art um, are, you know, have a completely different response for different uh, populations or demographics of our community. But um, th those are interesting, I think, um, initiatives within the museum sector, you know, seeing how we are capturing like the changing value and meaning of certain objects, um, rather than having a whole, a, a whole bunch of objects that never leave the vault or are even deaccessioned. you know, there's, a, there are a lot of interesting, very sensitive challenges around just particular objects now. Thanks, Susan. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I mean, it's yeah, it's really interesting. Adriana, your question is 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 very is an important question that like obviously is very relevant to museums now and and thinking about it in lots of different ways, thinking about artists that they bring in now, like contemporary artists, and then also thinking about what what does our permanent collection look like? What does it mean? Are we really thinking about these objects from an empathetic perspective of where they're coming from? Um, I know that. You know, I, I've been recently getting been getting more interested in ceramic objects from this region, from um, Middle Georgia, and like Susan's saying, you know, we think about just as an example, funerary objects that are discovered in in sort of an archaeological sense. Um, that these objects are sacred to Native American communities, and they were never meant to be on display in a museum in the first place. They were meant to be buried you know, with the person that they were buried with for a very specific reason. So thinking about like, what does it mean to now have this object? How do we do it? How do we, how, or how do we display this or not display this or return this or, 
there's just a lot, a lot that goes into that. And I think it all comes down to thinking about it from the perspective of the, the person or the people who that object is, you know, intrinsically tied to. Um, so all, all those, that, that whole question is really relevant and a really important question. And it's, it's it is exciting that museums are, um, are rethinking those, those ideas. Um, and so I, I think what you're saying about how does it not become performative? Well, they, they have to, museums and institutions and schools have to stick to what they say they're going to do. They have to stick to their values. They have to display and, and continue to display those values in their actions. Um, and, that, and that takes time, you know, it takes work and time and, and people that really care about those things. So it's a great, it was a great question. Um, any, any, anything else? Um, well, I, I really look forward to the continuation of this lecture series. Like I said, next, the next lecture will be um, October 20th at 7 p.m. So third Thursday of every month at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Um, I'll, you know, I'll send out things on social media and through email. And I hope you all can continue to join us on this journey about learning through empathy, thinking about how it can uh, be a really important way that we move through the world and move, you know, through our relationships and through our work. It just is a, it's an exciting, exciting way to approach things. Anybody else have anything to add? I just wanna leave some space in case anybody else has something to, to add. All right, well, thank you so much to our, um, our panelists, Carlene, Zorana, and Elif. And thank you to Georgia Humanities for helping to support this virtual lecture series for this year. And obviously to Wesleyan College for, for matching that grant and for making it possible to have these really wonderful experts in the field. And just like the idea that there's this, you know, I, I was kind of awakened to this field of empathy and thinking about it from a psychological and scientific and artistic perspective is so exciting. So I'm so glad we're able to kind of open it up to our community and, and I hope you all will, will join us again for the next lecture. So everyone enjoy your evening. Thank you for being here.